Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's research conference. Um, it's a real pleasure to have uh, Remy Coyoto today here with us. Um, many of us study symptomatic diseases. Some of us study asymptomatic diseases like kidney disease for myself. Um, and Remy studies uh, a very interesting group of conditions that actually present a lot of challenges um, when studying. So symptom-based conditions for trials present some challenges with identifying eligible study subjects as well as monitoring uh, treatment efficacy. So today we're going to hear about some of his experience um, in the de domain of headaches, but he's got a wide range of other experiences that we may hear about as well. Um, by way of introduction, Remy is a, a full-time faculty member here, as well as a member of the Evidence-Based Practice Center. He's an associate professor of, uh, in the Department of Community and Family Medicine. He came to Duke um, after his uh, uh, some, a period of time at UNC, uh, where he did his um, uh, training in epidemiology. He has a PhD from UNC in, health, in epidemiology. Prior to that, he did medical school at Stanford, and prior to that, he did his undergrad degree at Brown. Um, he's got a number of active studies that include um, a trial that we'll hear about today, uh, looking at um, personalized healthcare interventions for chronic daily headaches, as well as a trial of acupuncture for menopausal hot flashes. Um, he also has a variety of other training that sort of integrates uh, routine epidemiology and integrative medicine. He's um, a former Robert Johnson clinical scholar, as well as a former uh, Bravewell Collaborative Integrative Medicine Fellow. So please join me in welcoming Remy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We were talking a few minutes ago that um, you, some of you may have had the opportunity to go to Washington and hear the Prime Minister of Israel, but you're here instead, so thank you. Um, so. We had talked a little bit about what might be of interest to, uh, um, to this uh, research uh, conference audience. And so uh, what I'm going to try to do is talk about the headaches is an area that I'm interested in and I have experience in, and I'm going to talk mostly about headaches. But really the idea is to maybe use that as a backdrop to think about other symptoms that are the um, focus for, for conditions, for diagnoses, for treatment, for research studies, and see if there are any lessons learned um, that could be applied to, to other uh, symptoms um, and not just, just headaches. So I'm hoping for this to be a little bit wider of wider interest than just headache. Um, so to discuss headaches, I'd like to go a little bit into the classification system that we have um, for, for classifying or diagnosing um, headache disorders. And we we'll put a little bit of in there for those of you who might be interested in uh, headache um, option, treatment options, just to, to, to widen the, the, the interest uh, scope a little bit. Um, and then really make it a discussion. I don't have the answers for really how to uh, um, to apply what's relevant to headache to other conditions that may be of interest to you. So I would really encourage you to, to have a discussion about that um, and see where we go with that. Um, I don't have any financial, I don't have any uh, relationships with any pharmaceutical uh, companies. I do own two medical practices um, and I have, a, um, my, my wife owns a, a healthcare center in, in uh, Chapel Hill. But I don't think the, any of those really directly relate to, uh, to what we're talking about here today. So the overview of today's presentation, I'll tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from um, in looking at this particular issue. Um, talk a little bit about symptom-based conditions. Now, this is a term that I really just made up. It's not like an official term. It's not like a field of research that I know of. Um, but it's kind of descriptive. It's symptom-based conditions. And I think it's useful, um, at least in the context of this talk, to think about um, symptom-based conditions uh, um, sometimes. And that's really kind of the thesis, thesis of this talk. Um, again, focus on headache, give you an idea of how it's classified and some treatment options. And then we'll have a discussion about some of the challenges, opportunities, and, and how you um, might be able to get some insights to apply to some things of interest to you. So I approach this from multiple different perspectives. I'm a generalist, I'm a family doctor, and I became interested in headaches from that perspective. Um, as a resident, I was uh, interested in pain treatment in the primary care setting. Um, came to UNC um, in 1999 to do the Robert Johnson Clinical Scholars Program, and that was going to be, that was my focus. It was going to be, and it was, which was pain in the primary care setting in general, but more specifically, headache. Um, so I'm, that's how I, came into this whole uh, interesting, the whole 
developed this interest in, in headaches, um, both as a clinician but also as a researcher. I wanted to carve out a, a way f to, uh, to create a, a, um, a research niche focusing on headaches, not as a uh, neurologist, because neurologists are the ones who, by and large, are the ones whose specialty foc is carved out most of the headache uh, um, treatments and research, but by no means is that exclusive, is headache exclusively a neurological um, condition. Um, and so my perspective is also having learned how to, uh, to do some uh, clinical epidemiology, uh, um, applied that as well. And I've been here at Duke now for almost seven years in the um, Duke uh, Evidence-Based Practice Center, and that's where I've really learned to do systematic reviews and meta-analyses. That wasn't my training prior to this. And that, that influences my perspective also as to how I'm looking at uh, this, this, this whole uh, um, topic. Um, I am interested in personalized medicine, integrative medicine, um, and as I'll say, I am. I do have a, a K18 award right now from AHRQ uh, looking at uh, um, a personalized healthcare intervention um, for chronic deadly headache. So that's where I'm coming at this from. I'm not coming at it from a spe from a, as from specialty training. Um, I think that uh, somebody who has um, trained through neurology and has uh, expertise in headache um, would have a lot in common with our with our perspectives. But some of the, the some of the perspectives might be a little bit different. So again, this is my made up uh, um, way of kind of looking at things here. Symptom based conditions. So I propose to you. This is. Uh, um, just for your consideration, that there are kind of different symptoms apply to, to diagnoses in, uh, um, in, in different ways. So there are some things that I'm calling symptom-based conditions. Um, headache is, is, is one. Um, back pain, people talk a lot about um, you know, back pain research, and that's clearly a symptom, and that encompasses a whole area of research, and, and so that it's its own thing, I would say. Dizziness, I would put in there also. Um, and then there are a whole set of diagnoses. There is, you can diagnose somebody with depression. Now, technically, you're probably really needing to you know, use uh, more specific diagnoses like major depressive disorder. Um, but, but people will say, well, I'm depressed. You know, again, I'm, I'm approaching this as a primary care physician. People will talk about being depressed, and we might tell them, well, I think you're depressed. And those are symptoms, and yet there are also conditions, which is a little bit different because there are, there are official cl cat diagnostic categories and classification and criteria for some of these. And then there are a whole lot of other ways that symptoms play into things, like chest pain I see as different than headache. They're both pain. They can be due to a lot of different things. But you don't really have a whole field developed around chest pain per se. Chest pain is clearly a, a condition and a symptom, a symptom that leads us to, to figure out kind of what's the underlying etiology. But I propose to you that chest pain is seen differently than headache um, in day-to-day in -day practice. And, and by all means, if you feel, if you want to push back on that, do, please. This is just a, a proposal, um, proposed way of looking at things. Same thing with abdominal pain and fatigue. There really aren't diagnoses per se. There's chronic fatigue syndrome, but that's, that's not really, um, that, that might be its own category. So anyway, that, that's the framework that I'm just proposing um, for your consideration. Any, any uh, comments about that at this point? You want to shuffle this around a little bit, push back, add, add, add anything? Any comments? Yes? What about things like IBS? Uh, with that? So I thought about putting that, IBS came to mind here, and then I put it, didn't put it in here because IBS in and of itself is Assigning a, um, it is, for one, it's a diagnosis. I think we can, we can there are criteria, there are the Rome criteria for, for irritable bowel syndrome. And so that is already attempt has been made to, to classify a syndrome. Um, and they're, they're, even in the words, you're not talking about an irritable bowel. So you're, you're kind of giving presumptive etiology to symptoms which might present as constipation or abdominal pain. So I already see that as an attempt to, to, to talk about the underlying etiology in the name itself. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Okay. So that, that's, that's one, one reason why I, I didn't, this is that I'm really kind of thinking about a symptom per, per se. Other, other thoughts? Okay, so this is just a, uh, um, a, a way of, of, of looking at it. So let's focus for the next little while on headache. So what is headache? Well, headache is pain in the head. I mean, it's actually, I, it's literally the definition in, uh, in dictionaries. It's a pain. And, and also, if you look at um, medical-based dictionaries, also it's basically just that pain in the facial or head area. Um, it's a very common symptom. Um, many 
you know, the, the vast majority of people have headaches at some point in their life. Um, it is a very common chief complaint in primary care settings and in emergency room settings. Um, there is a huge industry that has been developed around headache. Um, there are very large professional societies. There are very uh, um, active patient advocacy groups um, around headache. Um, there are several peer-reviewed medical journals, one that's called headache, one that's called cephalalgia, which is really just the British term for headache, um, journal of headache pain, headache medicine, facial pain. There's, there's really a, a big industry around, around headache. It makes and a lot, uh, it's a source of revenue. It, it, it's a cause of a lot of transactions, financial transactions. Um, Imitrex, which is the first of the triptan medicines that are specific for migraines, it's sumatriptan is the brand name, um, was, uh, um, comes in at over a billion dollars a year. Um, and that's only one of seven commonly prescribed triptan medicines. And there are many other headache medicines. So it's a really pretty large industry. And in fact, I don't really think of, I don't really know of others' symptoms that are really the source of such, a, such an industry. Um, and it's not really an official, it's not an official clinical diagnosis of itself. There is no diagnosis of headache. It, it's still just descriptive. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about this international classification system, IHS, uh, by the International Headache uh, um, Society. So it's, it's very complicated. It's a huge document. It gets revised all the time. It's uh, also its own source of industry because people are spending a lot of time um, thinking and meeting about it and, and, and trying to categorize different headache disorders. So um, the, the, the classification scheme is one that it basically divides headaches into primary headaches and secondary headaches, with primary headaches being migraine, tension type headache, and uh, a few other uh, um, headaches that we aren't attributing it to an underlying a secondary, an, an underlying disorder such as a brain tumor or a meningitis. And then just about all the others which are considered secondary headaches. And when you look at the, um, the IHS classification scheme, you'll see almost all of them are said headache attributable to hypertension, um, um, brain injury, trauma, I I anything. So that's the basic uh, um, classification. And also that's useful in the primary care setting. That's, that's how I usually approach a patient who, I forgot to tell you, I'm interested. I, do, I see patients with headache also. That's an area of interest of mine. But when somebody comes and has a headache, really the first thing I do is really kind of figure out, is it a primary or is it a secondary headache? And most of them are primary. Most of the ones who end up coming in the primary care setting really are primary headaches. The ones that are due to, uh, um, to fever, meningitis, uh, um, hangover, um, head trauma, concussion, are not the ones that really trickle up to the, or trickle into the primary care setting that much. There's usually uh, other, other paths that people go. So those are the most common ones in the primary care setting. So in this classification scheme, there are over 300 separate types of headaches. I mean, it's kind of crazy. It, and they're broken down. I, I was going to copy, a, do a screenshot of all of the different classifications, but it was just got too busy. It's really maybe a little bit over the top. It's lots and lots and lots of fine cutting and all these different um, ways of classifying it. Um, they, you, you hear often about how, and I don't know if this is true, but, but in uh, um, the Eskimos have different, for, different descriptions for snow. Well, it's a little bit like that. You get people who are in the headache field, and they're going to describe things in very, very, uh, um, very specific ways. Um, and the other thing that's, I think, interesting to note is that most of these, or at least the part that are the primary, uh, prim primary headaches, which is a big chunk of those uh, more than 300 diagnoses, are, are symptom-based. They are basically what the patients tell us. So we classify them based on, on report. And I've, I'm not arguing that that shouldn't be the case. I'm just commenting that it's not based on, uh, on diagnostic studies. It's not based on in imaging studies, by and large. It's the nature, the quality, the frequency, the location of symptoms that people provide to us lead us to tell us, well, it fits in this one or two or three of these 300 different categories. So in a way, that's to me, that's kind of unique. I, don't, I can't think of any equivalent. I don't know of any other, uh, um, other symptom or other anything, really, that that really has 300 different diagnoses based on the, um, what the patients are, um, are telling us. So in a way, it's unique in that way. And the other thing is that the underlying etiology is often not incorporated into the diagnosis. Now, the headaches attributable to the underlying etiology, yes. But the primary headaches, 
not really. And so that's just uh, um, one of the things to, to discuss as well. Um, OK. So I'm going to give you examples here, three examples of what these uh, um, diagnoses or classifications really look like in the uh, um, IHS uh, um, classification scheme. So all I did was cut and paste directly from this, uh, um, from this diagnostic, it's not a diagnostic manual, but this uh, classification system. So migraine without aura. The details don't really matter, but I'll read it to you so you get the sense of really what defines it. Recurrent headache disorder manifesting in attacks lasting for 72 hours. Typical characteristics are unilateral location, pulsating quality, moderate or severe intensity, aggravated by routine physical activity, and associated with nausea and or photophobia and phonophobia. So this is really just to illustrate my point that they really are just bases, um, based on symptoms that give us the, the diagnosis. Um, and then right underneath the description for all of these is the actual diagnostic criteria. And they get kind of complicated. Um, so for migraine, this is migraine without aura, one of many, many different kinds of migraines. You have to have at least five attacks. Uh, I don't know what that one is there. You at least have five attacks that fulfill the following criteria. They have to have a certain duration of time. Um, Oh, I think the um, the ones actually the is a superscript from a uh, um, a reference. I apologize for those that, those numbers. So you have to have a certain duration of time. Can't be too short. Can't be too long. Has to have at least two of the following four characteristics, which is already subsetted from four of the characteristics that you have to meet: um, unilateral location, pulsating quality, moderate or severe pain intensity, aggravation by certain activities. Another criteria that has to be fulfilled is um, has to have at least one of the following, nausea or vomiting, and photophobia or phonophobia. And finally, it can't be accounted for in a better way by a different diagnosis uh, category. You get, I think you get the gist. It, 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 it's it's kind of complicated. In, in the attempt to make it very sp precise and being able to say, oh, well, this meets criteria, you come up with a somewhat complicated system. And one of the points I'm going to be making is that every time you do that, you're excluding some people. Because if you start with this idea that there is a spectrum of symptoms, and people can fall anywhere on a spectrum, and you very carefully cut out different parts of it to really get to a very precise definition, you are um, eliminating people. It's specificity and sensitivity at its, uh, you know, it's a good illustration of that. And so, so you have, and I have, I've looked for this, I've looked in the literature to see discussions about all these people who, who don't quite meet criteria because they've only had maybe four um, attacks in the last month or whatever and fall out. Where do they f where do they fit in this classification of 300 different uh, um, diagnoses? Well, they probably don't. So you have more than 300 um, diagnoses of which a very large portion, maybe minority of people, don't fit in any of them because they've been carved out so much. So that's just uh, an observation that I have about how this uh, um, how we go about um, diagnosing this. I um, won't go into detail, but here's just another example. Chronic migraine, there's a description that just basically means you have headaches five or 15 or more days per month, of which many have migraine as features. And then the same, same system of, of kind of complicated, well, you have to meet certain amount of these criteria. And then tension type headache, um, shouldn't have continued there, but tension type headache, same thing. They describe frequent headaches, bilateral, they describe the quality of it, and then the criteria. So you get the idea. This is how headaches are classified. We often say diagnosed, but classified in the, in the headache world. Any, any comments about any of this so far? To me, that's, that's um, unique to headaches. I don't, I don't know of, of similar. The IBS has not dissimilar ways of categorizing things. Um, but again, it's, it's already defined as a syndrome as opposed to a headache disorder. OK, I think enough said. So. Take a little bit of a uh, of a, a path, different path, and talk a little bit about um, migraine treatment considerations for for people here who might be interested in that. It, um, so the general approach to uh, um, treating or to approaching people who have headaches that might be migraine is to ensure accurate diagnosis. Now I've just spent the last ten minutes saying what exactly is kind of questioning what an actual accurate diagnosis is. So. But the idea is really to get to see if it really is migraineous. If there are, if, if the the type of headaches that a patient is um, describing fits in the general category of migraine, 
or something else, like tension type or a secondary order disorder. I think that's a, a very appropriate first step. And then there's usually two aspects of treatment. There is the discussion about what can be done to prevent these recurring episodes, prophylaxis. And then there is the other aspect, which is what do you do when you get one. So prophylaxis and treatment are, are uh, concurrent discussions that, that should be had and really are meant to be had when, when one is thinking about one's own uh, migraines or one is some, seeing a, a healthcare professional. And another consideration is there is this uh, phenomenon that is currently called medication overuse headache. It's been called different things in the last 15 years, 20, 15, 20 years. There's rebound um, headache, rebound migraine. Um, uh, uh, lots of different terms have been used, uh, transformed migraine. To the current term right now is medication overuse headache. It is an acknowledgement that there is this phenomenon that people with episodic migraines, a proportion of them, fairly high proportion of them, will develop a chronic migraine, chronic headache condition, and that medications are implicated in that. That the use of medications, whether they be over-the-counter prescription, are, are, is implicated in this transformation from episodic to, to chronic. And once you're in this chronic over chronic migraine, which is different, but or medication overuse headache, it's very difficult to treat because it becomes kind of kind of a mess. So it's really important to try to avoid getting into that situation by appropriate use of medications and not overuse of medications. Um, migraine prophylaxis. There was a, uh, a a very good clinical guideline that was published uh, um, a couple of years ago out of the, from the Canadian Headache Society guideline. And what they did is they looked at the evidence and found that there are different strategies for prophylaxis that can be used based on certain um, uh, how you classify the patient. There's certain certain things in about there's certain characteristics about patients that can lead you to one one form or another. Um, whether you've never had prior prophylaxis is, is one way. Uh, if you haven't, then that 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 gives that gives you more more freedom. But as opposed to somebody who's had unsuccessful prior prophylaxis, it, basically this is just one um, recommended way of of deciding which type of uh, prophylaxis is uh, is useful. Um, and and this. This came out a few years ago. To my knowledge, it hasn't been tested yet, so I don't haven't seen any research that looked at these uh, um, ways of seeing if it actually predicts a uh, um, um, response. But it, it, it seemed quite reasonable to me how they how they came about suggesting this. But there are, in general, you can give medicines for prophylaxis, and there are things you can do other than medicines. There are many, many medicines that have been proven effective in preventing migraines. Uh, astonishingly high number of, of medicines that have been tested um, um, in this respect, and many different classes of medicines. There are beta blockers, there are uh, um, angiotensin receptor blockers, tricyclic antidepressants, antineuroleptics, NSAIDs, calcium channel blockers. All of these have at least one in their class, if not more, that have been proven to, if, to, to decrease the number of, uh, of migraines. Um, so there's a lot to choose from. Um, there are also a number of non-pharmacological uh, interventions that have been tested and have been proven to be helpful in prophylaxis, and those include the herb uh, um, butterbur, um, um, vitamin uh, um, B2, riboflavin, coenzyme Q10, magnesium citrate. All of those have several studies in support of them. Omega-3 fatty acid supplementation seems to be ready to be added to the list. Um, hasn't yet met full. We don't. This hasn't been fish, f sufficiently proven, but it looks that way as well. So there are options as well. Um, there's this new device here, um, which is uh, um, FDA approved. It's one of the very few FDA approved treatments for any of this, actually. Botox, I forgot to mention that, but Botox injection is FDA approved for the prevention of, uh, um, of migraines. Um, that was developed, that was an observation that was found in the around 2000, where patients who were getting Botox injections for aesthetic reasons, if um, people reported that their migraines were, were decreasing in frequency, so they looked into that, and it, the evidence, it is FDA approved, and the evidence is apparently pretty strong in saying that that's a, a, a good way to prevent migraines. And then this device, I put it there because it's kind of new and different, you may want to know about it. It's a ten, essentially a TENS unit, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. You put this headband on for 20 minutes a day, and you, uh, um, that's all you do for, for th three months, and the data suggests that your headaches, uh, headaches go down. Um, the story about this is, this, it was right around this time last year that this got FDA approval, and I was a little bit blindsided by it because I, I, I didn't know about it. Um, and right about this time, I was giving 
a keynote speech at the um, on on migraine prevention at the uh, Greater Los Angeles uh, VA, the, their annual meeting, and was talking about options. And at the end, somebody said, "Well, what about this headband?" And I go, "Well, I don't know." And he pulls up his phone and goes, "Well, it just got FDA approved today." I'm like, okay, well, that's I didn't know about it. But it it, it what happened is that very day actually. Um, this is a small company in, in uh, Belgium, and they had requested FDA approval. They didn't know whether they're going to get it or not. And before they even knew that it was approved, there was an announcement by the FDA, which is what this person uh, saw that day, saying like, "Oh, there's an FDA approved uh, um, um, d device." And that company just got completely overwhelmed by, by all of a sudden all these uh, um, requests for this device. They weren't prepared at all, so they had they didn't they couldn't meet demand by um, at, at all. But they. They've caught up in their manufacturing. Um, and then there are acute treatment options. Um, the triptans are really the most common treatments that are commonly prescribed. They are highly effective when they're effective, which is generally for most people if they truly have migraines. Um, there are, so that's a, a, a good um, for most people who, for whom there's no contraindication. <coughs> and the primary contraindication is coronary artery disease. It's a vasoconstrictor, and it can constrict the coronary arteries. The, um, ar coronary arteries, but if you, but fortunately, in the the people, the the demographics of people who have migraines, people usually in their 18s to, to 40 year olds, don't doesn't overlap as much with the um, patients with symptomatic coronary artery disease, and migraines tend to peter out over over their of the lifespan. So so it's kind of worked out fortuitously that. Most people who have migraines don't have contraindications for uh, for triptans, um, but they don't work for everybody. There are side effects. They're expensive. The um, insurance companies limit the amount that they that they give, so so they're certainly not a panacea. Um, lots of other medicines have been shown to be uh, um, helpful to acute, acute treatment. Um, opioids and barbiturates are not um, really part of the standard of care for these episodic uh, um, pain disorders. Um, ultimately, it's really, in my view, and many people's view, not Drugs are not the shouldn't be the main answer to this episodic, not quite lifelong, but but very very pro protracted condition. For decades, people get migraines periodically. Um, the use of medicines, especially now that we know that all of the medicines that have been looked at thus far and are commonly used, are at least implicated in the development of medication overuse headache. There are none that have been freed of that that suspicion that they're uh, um, they're contributing to to um, this. So we have to be careful. So non-pharmacological approaches have a very important place. Um, very common sense things. You have, you try to avoid migraine triggers. Um, sleep is really important. Exercise is important. Avoiding uh, um, extremes of uh, routines like staying up all night or traveling or being jet lagged or or excesses is pretty important for people who have migraines. Um, uh, good ergonomics, good good uh, um, you know, movement and, and and posture of the body, and uh, eye str uh, good good eye strain. Just basic a lot. These this right here can go a long, long, long way to preventing a lot of migraines. Um, and then there are non-pharmacological approaches other than lifestyle. There are behavioral therapies, mindfulness-based stress reduction, cognitive behavioral therapy, and clinical hypnosis, all of which have been shown to be useful in the treatment of, uh, um, of migraine. Um, I'm interested in integrative medicine, which I define as incorporating um, approaches that are um, additional, outs incorporating in, in, in conventional care approaches that are not generally Commonly pre 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 um, prescribed or, or administered in, in in medicine, but but can be. That's how I define integrative medicine, and I have an interest in in acupuncture. So since I know the field well, I thought I'd take a few minutes just to tell you um, where what the evidence is for acupuncture for for migraine. Um, Cochrane collaboration review in two thousand and nine for migraine prophylaxis. Um, um, showed that it is it is helpful in the in the prevention of migraines. Um, this was a very interesting study that is worthy of, of you know a, a, a talk of its own. It's a patient level meta analysis, and I was part of uh, one of the founding uh, um, investigators of this to put together. We went and got um, individual clinical trials of acupuncture for chronic pain conditions and got permission from the um, investigators to to uh, um, do a patient level meta-analysis and it was uh, uh, really quite powerful there were up to um, 18,000 patients in, involved there were a lot of studies that were done in England and Germany on acupuncture trials and so uh, um, 
were able to get a, a pretty powerful analysis on that. And, it, and what was interesting about this particular study that was new is that we were able to show that there were significant uh, um, improvements in relative to placebo acupuncture. That's a whole other talk on its own, but the question about acupuncture in clinical trials is what are you comparing acupuncture to? Are you comparing it to usual care? Are you comparing it head-to-head -to, -head to another treatment? Are you, doing it, are you comparing it to a, a sham procedure, which is commonly done? Um, but what are you answering when you, when you uh, compare it to a sham procedure? Because there are no sham procedures that are entirely physiologically inert. So that's a whole area of, uh, of active question, uh, of research. And this, this meta-analysis showed that uh, um, there is a significant um, improvement in, in symptoms with um, chronic pain conditions compared to sham. And that was, that was kind of that was new because without this patient level meta analysis, we're left with a number of different studies that have um, con that have uh, conflicting results, or some some are positive, some are not. When you're comparing an acupuncture approach to a sham approach uh, intervention, any questions about any of this about the acupuncture sham? Um, and then this was another large pragmatic trial that was done in England that that showed in the primary care setting acupuncture was helpful in uh, um, in in uh, um, decreasing the number of migraines. And this was my, one of my first clinical trials so I put in here just for the fun of it. Um, and that is, uh, we did, when I was at UNC, we did an a, a NIH-funded clinical trial act, um, looking at patients with chronic daily headache from a tertiary care center, recruited from a headache clinic, and we randomized them to acupuncture, no acupuncture. So it was really just an adjunct to care and showed that it was effective in, in that setting. Um, but we could not comment on any placebo effects because there was no placebo control group. So that's a quick review of, of acupuncture for, um, for migraines and, and headaches. Um, overall key points, I think, are medical management, management is important, but non-pharmacal non approaches are really important as well. And they should not, not only should they not be forgotten, they really should be highlighted. They should be the, the mainstay, in my view, of, uh, um, of any type of primary headache uh, treatment, especially the lifestyle ones. Um, self and management, patient empowerment, really important. It's really ultimately what patients do for themselves that matters, and less so what is done to them via interventions. And so that just needs to be really em emphasized. And there are many options, many medical options, and many non, -pharma non pharmacological options. And that multidisciplinary approaches tend to be the, um, the, probably the best way to go about it. Okay, so that was just a little aside because I wanted to, to talk a little bit about. You know, at least for migraines, for people who are interested. So back to the overall kind of bigger picture. Um, challenges of symptom-based research. Um, these are just some that I've come across that I put out for you to consider, and then hopefully this will lead to some discussion. Um, so really, how to, one of the challenges is how to define the symptom or condition. So people will say that they have a symptom, and that's fine, but do, how much should we try to really narrow in on exactly what those definitions are? I don't know. How much should the underlying etiology factor into um, selecting patients for a clinical trial for de determining what kind of uh, um, condition they have? Or, um, you know, does it matter? Presumably it matters, I think, because generally we try to try to match a mechanism of action for an intervention with the underlying ideology, so presumably it matters, but, but often we're not doing that. In, in headache, we're not really doing that much, and maybe for in back pain, I don't think we're doing that much either, because there's a lot that we don't know about the underlying ideology for back pain. There's this there's not consensus as to what's actually causing the, um, the symptoms and the, um, and the signs and the um, and, uh, things that lead to disability and back pain. Um, so what do you do in those situations? Um, in the case of headache, it's a pretty complicated, ever-changing, potentially unreliable classification system, bit of a moving target, and it's, uh, it's kind of unwieldy, but, but at least it's an attempt, right? I mean, I think the headache field has done more than other symptom-based research fields does that mean others need to do it? I don't know, or do we need to do it differently? Um, how do we know how to best mass inter match interventions that are appropriate for a given person when we don't necessarily know the etiology? What are the most appropriate outcome measures? If the presenting symptom, presenting feature, if the, the reason for somebody presenting in a clinic or for a research study is a symptom, what's the most 
reasonable outcome measure? Well, presumably the symptom should be probably it, and the headache is probably frequency and, and uh, um, severity of the headaches. But is, is that it? Is that the most important? Um, are there other things? And, and those are all um, open-ended questions. Um, eligibility criteria for inclusion in studies, how exactly, you know, how, how finely tuned do you want to go down this, this ever-branching tree to, to include specific conditions versus being a little bit more general and a little bit less specific? Um, and then how do we ab apply this to other conditions? So that was my attempt to bring headache, to use it as an example to kind of bring up questions about symptom-based um, of research. So that being said, do you have things that come to mind, insights you want to share, or questions? What, what would be interest to you? Great, well, thanks, Tony. Maybe I'll just kick it off with one question. Um, so for a lot of patients, they may have to find a therapy that works best for them. It seems like that lends itself to designs like N of one trials. Can you speak about any experience in how they feel about N of one trials and then potentially other specific areas? So you and I were talking just a little bit before this talk about adaptive designs and creative designs and N of one. There have been very few, none that I know of, of end of one trials for, um, for, for headache. Um, but I think that there is potential there. Um, and I, I, I don't know yet. I'm actually, I think it's a great question that leads up to, to questions that you might have about how, how you think creative designs might be helpful in the field of headache. Because I, I don't know. It hasn't been done much in this field, but I think there's potential. Do you have thoughts about how to, how to apply it in one, end of one designs? No, I imagine that. Most patients with headaches willing to enroll in a trial have had some successes, but mostly failures of existing therapies. Mm -hmm. And then uh, identifying, you know, finding ways to help them most efficiently find effective therapies would be, I think, valuable to the headache field. Mm -hmm. And there may be some ways to protocolize that in a way to have health systems be able to help patients with symptoms find effective therapies faster than. Um, with uh, you know haphazard disorganized approach, so, just about. that brings up, and I, I I'm glad you bring this up. So one thing I haven't really talked about, but I can mention here is this uh, um, ARC funded study that we've just com completed, and we had uh, um, focus groups where we had 30 patients who had chronic daily headache um, with migraine features uh, recruited from Duke from the Family Medicine Clinic. And we had them go through, uh, um, I, I suggested a personalized health plan to have them, uh, um, to help them figure out, not help them figure out, but, but try to help them. Basically, uh, individualized uh, um, a therapeutic plan for them. And then we had focus groups. And we found that, that they really all had a lot to say about things that worked and didn't work for them. And I was struck by how interested they were in each other's stories. The stories that, and I'll say stories for lack of a better word, their, their narratives, their experiences, was of great interest to the participants in these focus groups about these uh, uh, other people. So anecdotal expressions of experiences seem to be very meaningful and relevant to the people in that group. Now, it's a little harder for us as clinical scientists to, to quantify that and say, okay, well, let's find something, let's, let's find a way to get those stories done in a way that, that has validity in ways that we would recognize as validity. That was my clinical research um, or clinical researcher kind of skepticism about that part. But on the other hand, I'm seeing real interest, a, a strong interest of the patient saying, like, that worked for you or that didn't work? Tell me about it. I want to know more. I think maybe quality, that, that gives me thoughts that what's lack, what could advance the field at this point is really good qualitative research to really go beyond the, we've tried to quantify things in the headache field, maybe to a fault with that whole classification system and, and trying to find quantitative, good quantitative measures about headache frequency and severity. Don't disagree with that, that's fine. But there may be much more to that that needs to be really explored. And that might be where the, the future real benefit might be of future research. Any questions from? Yes. <clears throat> I sort of have a recent interest in sort of the use of secondary data 
Can you tell us a little bit about how, if it is at all possible to study something like headache in that sort of a setting? But when you're using data that's not very clinically based with the symptom report, the patient symptom report available to you. Could you hear in the back? Sorry. The question is about uh, I'm using secondary data. And, and is it possible that we have what it takes now, either the databases and the, and the methods um, and maybe the questions to, to apply um, to, to existing databases and doing secondary analyses? Is, is that a fair response to, to your question? I think that's a great question. Do you have ideas about how it could be done? Well, I think it depends on how, how it's, it's being recorded, and that's a special question for you. Whether or not it's important, whether or not the, all those symptoms get translated into some form into the diagnosis or not, or whether or not there's been work to look at prescription patterns that are very specific to this, well, to headache. I mean, those would be my first thoughts to so, approach it. So, um, how, are, how are the diagnoses being reported? So, I'm in two worlds, at least. One is the primary care world, which is mainly where I'm from. But I attend the meetings. I'm part of the American Headache Society. I, I see I'm kind of part of that society as well. So, I have a sense of how headache specialists also um, do this. Many of the headache specialists will be very, very uh, detailed about which of those 300 branches they pick. And so they really do. And there are ICD-9 codes associated with that. It's, it's, it's uh, correlated to, you know, they, they, they create ICD-9 codes for each of these. So there are, there are um, specific diagnoses that are, that are made, where they're recorded, what EMRs they use, I don't know. But at least they're recording it. That is probably no more than 5% of the diagnoses that are recorded for people who seek care for, for headache disorders. A very small proportion of patients with any of these disorders end up seeing specialists. And of those specialists, a proportion will, 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 will fine-tune those. The rest of us don't do that. I mean, when I see a patient with, with headache, I don't go through the effort of going, I go to this uh, classification system, and I don't figure out whether it's, you know, how many decimal points beyond the ICD-9 code. I don't. The, in case you're interested, it's 784.0 for headache. That is commonly most of what we do in the primary care setting. So we don't have that fine-tuning of that. So we don't, we, we, we just don't, we wouldn't have it in these databases. And even if I were to do a better, if you would, job of really trying to figure out which exact code it is, how valid is the original classification scheme, I don't know. And how good am I at following it, I don't know. And how reliable it is, and how, how much inter rate of reliability would there be, I don't know either. So I don't think that the whatever the existing databases we have have very precise or accurate or fine-tuned um, diagnosis. So that's just one, one observation. Um, I think Medicare databases are probably not that useful for here because it's not really the Medicare population for which this is really that much the issue. And I just don't think there's really, I don't think that's, it's just not quite the right population. And until we really figure out big data and, and electronic records and really large systems of recording accurately, and I don't think, we're, I could be wrong, the field is advancing faster than I know through colleagues here at DCRI, but, but I don't think we're there yet to really have that. But there, that could be something we could plan for, unless you think differently. You think that there is potential more than I just kind of shot down. In part because of the age range, and in part because I, I, I can't imagine that many people who are you know, writing down their, their ICD-9 codes really are doing it in a, in a very systematic way. For those two reasons. Do you think that there's is there any sort of standardization of care that you could find in the clinical services or the medications that people are prescribed to determine, like sort of work backwards to say that this seems to represent a headache affected person? There's potentially that 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 that, that could be. Headache care is so diversely provided from so many different providers and settings and that, that, it's, uh, um, that it makes it a little bit hard to, to figure out what is actually currently being, being done. 
Um, and in part because of the fact that it's not an official diagnosis, right? And, and, it, and, and many times in the primary care setting, we will treat symptoms, regardless of where we think it, we call it a migraine or attention type or whether we can't tell. We're, we're helping people with their headaches. And we may, not even die, we may not even code it because oftentimes those are in the context of clinical encounters that, that are not just for, for headaches. So there's all this invisible, if you will, care that's being done invisible to, to systems that, that we can't really... Unless we were to systematically try to get collect those data, we, we don't have those data. But we that represents a challenge of symptom-based research, I think. So we have a question from one of uh, our colleagues watching uh, from uh, another site. Great. Are there any trials here at Duke um, uh, on headaches? And then are there um, any active trials sort of being done by the DCRI? Well, there's the one that I just finished, um, which is this personalized health care plan um, among Duke Family Medicine Center patients, 30, 30 patients. It was a small pilot study. Um, there is one at UNC, if that counts, <laughs> um, on, uh, on, on nutrition, um, on the role of certain nutritional supplements, including fatty acids, omega-3 fatty acids. And that is, to my knowledge, all locally being done. I don't know if there being uh, other ones. There may be, there, I wouldn't know myself if there are um, drug trials being, if, there are, if we're recruiting for any drug trials, I don't know. I haven't heard of it myself, but I don't know that there is. And then how do you uh, disentangle sort of the subjective nature of headache descriptions, some of the cultural differences and how pain and pain in, in the head might be described? Um, across the age spectrum. How does that come into sort of being able to study this? It, it, it it'll, makes it even more interesting. <laughs> um, it really does. I mean, any symptoms are culturally influenced. <laughs> um, reporting of symptoms, highly culturally influenced. We know that with hot flashes. We know that with panic disorder symptoms. We know that the culture that somebody is from highly influences the attribution people have to their symptoms, uh, the, and, and all this. So, and headache is is really no different. Um, so it just makes for a very uh, um, a very rich, <laughs> if you will, um, uh, field. And it it highlights that for all the advances in a way that the headache field has made, and it has made incredible advances. I mean, it developed the triptans, which was a revolutionary um, treatment modality. I mean, it really has affected many, many millions of people for the acute treatment. Um, Botox, these other supplements, there's this, there's, there, it's, it's such a lucrative field that there's a lot, a lot of money involved. And so we've made, not so we've made progress, but we have, that, that may have helped. And yet, there's so much that we really don't have a clue and haven't looked at. And in part because there's very little for federal funding. Um, one of the complaints that headache researchers have is it's not really something of interest to most um, certainly not the NIH, there hasn't been a very strong interest there. PCORI um, being an institute that is responsive to patient um, requests and provider priorities, it's trickling, it's, it's percolating up. I mean, there, are, it, there is clearly interest. I know because at the Duke Evidence Practice Center, we, we work with PCORI and we help them kind of sort out their various priorities, funding priorities, and, and headache is, is, is there. It absolutely is. It was one of the 15, um, uh, in fact, it was a non-pharmacologic versus pharmacological comparison that made the list for one of these $10 million uh, PCORI pragmatic trials. So it is, it's reaching their, uh, um, their level of, of awareness. Having said that, th those trials didn't get funded. None of the, the first round of funding didn't include a headache trial. And NIH isn't funding them. So it's not like there is a... There's a, a lot of people who have it have headaches. There is this advocacy, patient advocacy groups that are that are clamoring for for attention and help. You get a lot of pharmaceutical companies who are very inv invested because there's a lot of pharmaceutical. Uh, um, uh, there's a huge market to be had, but then that's really pretty much it. There isn't. It's it's not an orphan symptom. It's not, but it it, it doesn't doesn't have a home, mm -hmm. and I think that's another thing that illustrates. You know, nor does back pain necessarily have a home. I mean, we're, who's really going to, to take the big picture? Well, PCORI is one I'm very excited about. I think PCORI has an opportunity to make a difference, and maybe that'll be a, a way to go. But, you know, without the funding, it's kind of hard, you know, it's chicken and an egg, but the, the, there's no real financial funding body that has taken it on its own and saying, like, we really want to, to figure out where the research gaps and go with it. That, that hasn't happened. 
Any last questions? So uh, one last one. So you have the unique experience of practicing sort of traditional, uh, uh, you know, regular biomedical medicine as well as integrative care and uh, have research experience in pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic mm -hmm. therapies. Um, if you were uh, a betting man, mm -hmm. Betting on uh, the best studies to advance the field, mm -hmm. say the you know through the PCORI mechanism of looking at pharmacologic versus non-pharmacologic mm -hmm. therapies, what would you put your bet on? A pharmacologic solution or a non-pharmacologic solution? Wow, I I would love and maybe I'll get that opportunity someday to to, to really put that bet in there. Um, pharmacological solutions are part of the solution. We know that, and we have ample evidence to show where pharmaceutical um, uh, available products and pharmacological approaches are helpful, and they are. We know that. What we don't know is about the non-pharmacological ones. And for many reasons, I think that there is tremendous, tremendous, like very, very great potential for those non-pharmacological uh, um, ones. So I guess my, my bet would be, would if we were to bet, if society were to bet on non-pharmacological approaches to, to, uh, um, to headache, and, would we get a big bang for our buck? Absolutely. Um, we've gotten, we know what we got on the, on the pharmaceutical side. We don't know really what we have um, on the non-pharmacological, and that's, I, I think we really do need to do that. I think there's a lot to be gained by understanding how to prevent and manage these primary headache disorders in the lifestyle and non-pharmacological range. I'd bet on that. Cool, great, thank you. Well, thank you everybody, and I uh, want to thank Remy again for giving me a well, thank you for being here. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you.